The Iliad by Homer, translated by Alexander Pope. Book 10, Argument, The Night Adventure of Diomed and Ulysses. Upon the refusal of Achilles to return to the army, the distress of Agamemnon is described in the most lively manner. He takes no rest that night, but passes through the camp, awakening the leaders and contriving all possible methods for the public safety. Menelaus, Nestor, Ulysses, and Diomed are employed in raising the rest of the captains. They call a council of war and determine to send scouts into the enemy's camp to learn their posture and discover their intentions. Diomed undertakes this hazardous enterprise and makes choice of Ulysses for his companion. In their passage, they surprise Dolon, whom Hector had sent on a like design to the camp of the Grecians. From him they are informed of the situation of the Trojan and auxiliary forces, and particularly of Rhesus and the Thracians who were lately arrived. They pass on with success, kill Rhesus with several of his officers, and seize the famous horses of that prince with which they return in triumph to the camp. The same night continues, the scene lies in the two camps. All night the chiefs before their vessels lay and lost in sleep the labors of the day, all but the king, with various thoughts oppressed. His country's cares lay rolling in his breast. As when by lightnings Jove's ethereal power foretells the rattling hail or weighty shower, or sends soft snows to whiten all the shore, or bids the brazen throat of war to roar, by fits one flash succeeds as one expires, and heaven flames thick with momentary fires, so bursting frequent from Atrides' breast sighs, following sighs, his inward fears confessed. Now o'er the fields dejected he surveys, from thousand Trojan fires the mounting blaze, hears in the passing wind their music blow, and marks distinct the voices of the foe. Now looking backwards to the fleet and coast, anxious he sorrows for the endangered host, he rends his hair in sacrifice to Jove, and sues to him that ever lies above, Inly he groans while glory and despair divide his heart and wage a double war. A thousand cares his laboring breast revolves. To seek sage Nestor now the chief resolves with him in wholesome counsels to debate what yet remains to save the afflicted state. He rose and first he cast his mantle round. Next on his feet the shining sandals bound. A lion's yellow spoils his back concealed. His warlike hand appointed javelin held. Meanwhile his brother, pressed with equal woes, alike denied the gifts of soft repose, laments for Greece, that in his cause before so much had suffered and must suffer more. A leopard's spotted hide his shoulders spread, a brazen helmet glittered on his head. Thus, with a javelin in his hand, he went to wake Atrides in the royal tent. Already waked Atrides, he descried, his armor buckling at his vessel's side. Joyful they met, the Spartan thus begun, Why puts my brother his bright armor on? Sends he some spy amidst these silent hours to try on camp and watch the Trojan powers? But say, what hero shall sustain that task? Such bold exploits uncommon courage ask. Guideless alone, through night's dark shade to go, amidst a hostile camp explore the foe? To whom the king? In such distress we stand, no vulgar counsel our affairs demand. Greece to preserve is now no easy part, but asks high wisdom, deep design, and art. For Jove, averse, our humble prayer denies, and bows his head to Hector's sacrifice. What eye has witnessed, or what ear believed, in one great day, by one great arm achieved, such wondrous deeds as Hector's hand has done? And we beheld the last revolving sun, what honors the beloved of Jove adorn, sprung from no god and of no goddess born, yet such his acts as Greeks unborn shall tell, and curse the battle where their fathers fell. Now speed thy hasty course along the fleet. There call great Ajax and the prince of Crete. Ourself to hoary Nestor will repair, to keep the gods on duty be his care. For Nestor's influence best that quarter guides, whose son, with Marion, o'er the watch presides. To whom the Spartan, these thy orders born, say, shall I stay, or with dispatch return? There shall thou stay, the king of men replied, else may we miss to meet without a guide, the path so many and the camp so wide. Still, with your voice the slothful soldiers raise, urged by their father's fame their future praise. Forget we now our state and lofty birth, not titles here but works must prove our worth. 
To labor is the lot of man below, and when Jove gave us life, he gave us woe. This said, each parted to his several cares. The king to Nestor's sable ship repairs. The sage protector of the Greeks he found, stretched in his bed, with all his arms around the various colored scarf, the shield he rears, the shining helmet, and the pointed spears, the dreadful weapons of the warrior's rage, that old in arms disdained the peace of age. Then, leaning on his hand his watchful head, the hoary monarch raised his eyes and said, What art thou speak that on designs unknown while others sleep thus range the camp alone? Seekest thou some friend or knightly sentinel? Stand off, approach not, but thy purpose tell. O son of Nellius, thus the king rejoined, pride of the Greeks and glory of thy kind, lo, here the wretched Agamemnon stands, the unhappy general of the Grecian bands, whom Jove decrees with daily cares to bend, and woes that only with his life shall end. Scarce can my knees these trembling limbs sustain, and scarce my heart support its load of pain. No taste of sleep these heavy eyes have known, confused and sad, I wander thus alone, with fears distracted, with no fixed design, and all my people's miseries are mine. If aught of use thy walking thoughts suggest, since cares like mine deprive thy soul of rest, impart thy counsel and assist thy friend. Now let us jointly to the trench descend, at every gate the fainting god excite, tired with the toils of day and watch of night, else may the sudden foe our works invade, so near and favored by the gloomy shade. To him thus Nestor, Trust the powers above, nor think proud Hector's hopes confirmed by Jove. How ill agree the views of vain mankind, and the wise counsels of the eternal mind. Audacious Hector, if the gods ordain that great Achilles rise and rage again, what toils attend thee, and what woes remain? Lo, faithful Nestor, thy command obeys. The care is next our other chiefs to raise. Ulysses, Diomed we chiefly need, Megis for strength, Oleus, famed for speed, some others be dispatched of nimbler feet to those tall ships remotest of the fleet where lie great Ajax and the king of Crete. To rouse the Spartan I myself decree, dear as he is to us and dear to thee, yet must I tax his sloth that claims no share with his great brother in his martial care. Him it behoved to every chief to sue, preventing every part performed by you, for strong necessity our toils demands, claims all our hearts and urges all our hands. To whom the king, with reverence we allow thy just rebukes, yet learn to spare them now. My generous brother is of gentle kind, he seems remiss but bears a valiant mind. Through too much deference to our sovereign sway, content to follow when we lead the way, but now our ills, long ere the, the rest he rose and sought my tent, the chiefs you named already at his call prepared to meet us near the navy wall assembling there between the trench and gates near the night gods our chosen council waits then none said nestor shall his rule withstand for great examples justify command with that the venerable warrior rose the shining greaves his manly legs enclose his purple mantle golden buckles joined warm with the softest wool and doubly lined then rushing from his tent, he snatched in haste his steely lance that lightened as he passed. The camp he traversed through the sleeping crowd, stopped at Ulysses' tent and called aloud. Ulysses, sudden as the voice was sent, awake, starts up and issues from his tent. What new distress, what sudden cause of fright, thus leaves you wandering in the silent night? O oh, prudent chief, the Pylian sage replied, wise as thou art, be now thy wisdom tried. Whatever means of safety can be sought, whatever counsels can inspire our thought, whatever methods or to fly or fight, all, all depend on this important night. He heard, returned, and took his painted shield, then joined the chiefs and followed through the field. Without his tent, bold Diomed they found, all sheathed in arms, his brave companions round, each sunk in sleep extended on the field, his head reclining on his bossy shield. A wood of spears stood by, that, fixed upright, shot from their flashing points a quivering light. A bull's black hide composed the hero's bed. A splendid carpet rolled beneath his head. Then, with his foot, old Nestor gently shakes the slumbering chief, and in these words awakes. Rise, son of Tydeus, to the brave and strong rest seems inglorious, and the night too long. 
but sleepest thou now, when from yon hill the foe hangs o'er the fleet, and shades our walls below? At this soft slumber from his eyelids fled, the warrior saw the hoary chief, and said, Wondrous old man, whose soul no respite knows, though years and honors bid thee seek repose, let younger Greeks our sleeping warriors wake, ill fits thy age these toils to undertake. My friend, he answered, generous is thy care, these toils my subjects and my sons might bear. Their loyal thoughts and pious love conspired to ease a sovereign and relieve a sire. But now the last despair surrounds our host. No hour must pass, no moment must be lost. Each single Greek in this conclusive strife stands on the sharpest edge of death or life. Yet if my years thy kind regard engage, employ thy youth as I employ my age, succeed to these my cares and rouse the rest, he serves me most who serves his country best. This said, the hero o'er his shoulders flung a lion's spoils that to his ankles hung, then seized his ponderous lance and strode along. Megis the bold with Ajax famed for speed, the warrior roused and to the entrenchments lead, and now the chiefs approach the knightly guard, a wakeful squadron, each in arms prepared. The unwearied watch their listening leaders keep, and couching close repel invading sleep. So faithful dogs their fleecy charge maintain, with toil protected from the prowling train, when the gaunt lioness with hunger bold springs from the mountains toward the guarded fold. Through breaking woods her rustling course they hear, loud and more loud, the clamors strike their ear of hounds and men. They start, they gaze around, watch every side and turn to every sound. Thus watched the Grecians, cautious of surprise. Each voice, each motion, drew their ears and eyes. Each step of passing feet increased the affright, and hostile Troy was ever full in sight. Nestor with joy the wakeful band surveyed, and thus accosted through the gloomy shade. "'Tis well, my sons, your nightly cares employ, else must our host become the scorn of Troy. Watch thus, and Greece shall live, the hero said, then o'er the trench." The following chieftains led. His son and godlike Marion marched behind, for these the princes to their council joined. The trenches passed the assembled kings around in silent state the consistory crowned. A place there was yet undefiled with gore, the spot where Hector stopped his rage before, when night descending from his vengeful hand reprieved the relics of the Grecian band. The plain, Besides, with the mangled cores was spread, and all his progress marked by heaps of dead. There sat the mournful kings, when Nellis's son, the council opening in these words, begun. Is there, said he, a chief so greatly brave, his life to hazard and his country save? Lives there a man who singly dares to go to yonder camp, or sees some straggling foe, or favored by the night approach so near their speech, their counsels, and designs to hear? If to besiege our navies they prepare, or Troy once more must be the seat of war, this could he learn, and to our peers recite, and pass unharmed the dangers of the night. What fame were his through all succeeding days, while Phoebus shines, or men have tongues to praise? What gifts his grateful country would bestow? What must not Greece to her deliverer owe? A sable you each leader should provide, with each a sable lambkin by her side. At every right, his share should be increased, and his the foremost honors of the feast. Fear held them mute, alone, untaught to fear, Tydides spoke. The man you seek is here. Through yon black camps to bend my dangerous way, some god within commands and I obey. But let some other chosen warrior join to raise my hopes and second my design. By mutual confidence and mutual aid, great deeds are done and great discoveries made. The wise new prudence from the wise acquire, and one brave hero fans another's fire. Contending leaders at the word arose, each generous breast with emulation glows. So brave a task each Ajax strove to share. Bold Marion strove and Nestor's valiant heir. The Spartan wished the second place to gain, and great Ulysses wished nor wished in vain. Then thus the king of men the contest ends. Thou first of warriors, and thou best of friends, undaunted Diomed, what chief to join in this great enterprise is only thine. Just be thy choice, without affection made. To birth or office no respect be paid. Let worth determine here. The monarch spake, and inly trembled for his brother's sake. Then thus, the godlike Diomed rejoined, my choice declares the impulse of my mind. 
How can I doubt while great Ulysses stands to lend his counsels and assist our hands? A chief, whose safety is Minerva's care, so famed, so dreadful in the works of war, blessed is his conduct. I know aid require wisdom like his might pass through flames of fire. It fits thee not before these chiefs of fame, replied the sage, to praise me or to blame. Praise from a friend or censure from a foe are lost on hearers that our merits know. But let us haste, night rolls the hours away, the reddening orient shows the coming day. The stars shine fainter on the ethereal plains, and of night's empire but a third remains. Thus having spoke, with generous ardor pressed, in arms terrific their huge limbs they dressed, a two-edged falchion, thrice amid the brave, an ample buckler to Tydides gave. Then in a leathern helm he cased his head, short of its crest and with no plume or spread such as by youths unused to arms are worn. No spoils enrich it, and no studs adorn. Next him Ulysses took a shining sword, a bow and quiver with bright arrows stored, a well-proved cask with leather braces bound. Thy gift, Mariones, his temples crowned. Soft wool within, without, in order spread, a boar's white teeth grinned horrid o'er his head. This from Amnintor, rich Ormenus's son, or to like us by fraudful rapine won, and gave Amphidamus from him the prize, Molus received the pledge of social ties, the helmet next by Marion was possessed, and now Ulysses' thoughtful temples pressed. Thus sheathed in arms the council they forsake, and dark through paths of like their progress take. Just then in sign she favoured their intent, a long-winged heron great Minerva sent. This, though surrounding shades obscured their view, by the shrill clang and whistling wings they knew, as from the right she soared, Ulysses prayed, hailed the glad omen, and addressed the maid. O daughter of that god, whose arm can wield the avenging bolt and shake the dreadful shield, O thou, for ever present in my way, who all my motions, all my toils survey, safe may we pass beneath the gloomy shade, safe by thy succor to our ships conveyed, and let some deed this signal night adorn to claim the tears of Trojans yet unborn. Then godlike Diomed preferred his prayer. Daughter of Jove, unconquered Pallas, here, great queen of arms, whose favor Tydeus won, as thou defendest the sire, defend the son, when on Esopus's banks the banded powers of Greece he left and sought the Theban towers, praise was his charge, received with peaceful show. He went a legate, but returned a foe. Then, helped by thee, and covered by the shield, he fought with numbers and made numbers yield. So now be present, O celestial maid, so still continue to the race thine aid. A youthful steer shall fall beneath the stroke, untamed, unconscious of the galling yoke, with ample forehead and with spreading horns, whose taper tops refulgent gold adorns. The heroes prayed in palace from the skies, accords their vow, succeeds their enterprise, now, like two lions panting for the prey, with dreadful thoughts they trace the weary way. Through the black horrors of the exsanguinated plain, through dust, through blood, o'er arms and hills of slain. Nor less bold Hector and the sons of Troy, on high designs the wakeful hours employ. The assembled peers, their lofty chief enclosed, who thus the counsels of his breast proposed. What glorious man for high attempts prepared dares greatly venture for a rich reward? Of yonder fleet a bold discovery make, What watch they keep, and what resolves they take. If now, subdued, they meditate their flight, And spent with toil neglect the watch of night, His be the chariot that shall please him most Of all the plunder of the vanquished host, His the fair steeds that all the rest excel, And his the glory to have served so well. A youth there was among the tribes of Troy, Dolon his name, Eumedes' only boy, Five girls beside, the reverend Harold told. Rich was the sun in brass and rich in gold. Not blessed by nature with the charms of face, but swift of foot and matchless in the race. Hector, he said, my courage bids me meet this high achievement and explore the fleet. But first, exalt thy scepter to the skies and swear to grant me the demanded prize, the immortal courses and the glittering car that bear Pelides through the ranks of war. Encouraged thus, no idle scout I go, Fulfill thy wish, their whole intention know, even to the royal tent pursue my way, and all their counsels, all their aims betray. The chief then heaved, 
the golden scepter high, attesting thus the monarch of the sky, be witness thou, immortal lord of all, whose thunder shakes the dark aerial hall, by none but Dolan shall this prize be borne, and him alone the immortal steeds adorn. Thus Hector swore, the gods were called in vain, but the rash youth prepares to scour the plain. Across his back the bended bow he flung, a wolf's grey hide around his shoulders hung, a ferret's downy fur his helmet lined, and in his hand a pointed javelin shined. Then, never to return, he sought the shore, and trod the path his feet must tread no more. Scarce had he passed the steeds and Trojan throng, still bending forward as he coursed along, when on the hollow way the approaching tread Ulysses marked, and thus to Diomed, O oh friend, I hear some step of hostile feet, moving this way or hastening to the fleet, some spy perhaps to lurk beside the main, or nightly pillager that strips the slain, yet let him pass and win a little space, then rush behind him and prevent his pace. But if too swift of foot he flies before, confine his course along the fleet and shore, betwixt the camp, and him our spears employ, and intercept his hoped return to Troy. With that they stepped aside, and stooped their head as Dolan passed, behind a heap of dead. Along the path the spy unwary flew, soft at just distance both the chiefs pursue. So distant they, and such the space between, as when two teams of mules divide the green, to whom the hind like shares of land allows, when now new furrows part the approaching ploughs, now Dolan, listening, heard them as they passed, Hector, he thought, had sent, and checked his haste, till scarce at distance of a javelin's throw, no voice exceeding, he perceived the foe, as when two skilful hounds the leveret wind, or chase through woods obscure the trembling hind. Now lost, now seen, they intercept his way, and from the herd still turn the flying prey. So fast, and with such fears, the Trojan flew, so close, so constant, the bold Greeks pursue. Now... Almost on the fleet the dastard falls, and mingles with the guards that watched the walls, when brave Tydides stopped, a generous thought inspired by Pallas in his bosom wrought, lest on the foe some forward Greek advance, and snatch the glory from his lifted lance. Then, thus aloud, Whoe'er thou art remain, this javelin else shall fix thee to the plain, he said, and high in air the weapon cast, which willful aired, and o'er his shoulder passed, then fixed in earth, against the trembling wood, the wretch stood propped and quivered as he stood. A sudden palsy seized his turning head, his loose teeth chattered and his color fled. The panting warriors seize him as he stands and with unmanly tears his life demands. Oh, spare my youth, and for the breath I owe, large gifts of price my father shall bestow. Vast heaps of brass shall in your ships be told, and steel well-tempered and refulgent gold. To whom Ulysses made this wise reply, Whoe'er thou art, be bold, nor fear to die. What moves thee, say, when sleep has closed the sight, To roam the silent fields in dead of night? Camest thou the secrets of our camp to find, By Hector prompted, or thy daring mind? Or art some wretch by hopes of plunder led Through heaps of carnage to despoil the dead? Then thus, pale Dolan, with a fearful look, Still, as he spoke, his limbs with horror shook, Hither I came, by Hector's words deceived, much did he promise, rashly I believed, no less a bribe than great Achilles' car, and those swift steeds that sweep the ranks of war, urged me, unwilling, this attempt to make, to learn what counsels, what resolves you take. If now subdued, you fix your hopes on flight, and tired with toils neglect the watch of night. Bold was thy aim, and glorious was the prize, Ulysses, with a scornful smile, replies, Far other rulers those proud steeds demand, and scorn the guidance of a vulgar hand, even great Achilles scarce their rage can tame. Achilles sprung from an immortal dame. But say, be faithful, and the truth recite. Where lies encamped the Trojan chief to-night? Where stand his courses? In what quarter sleep their other princes? Tell what watch they keep. Say, since this conquest, what their counsels are or here to combat from their city far, or back to Ilion's walls transfer the war? Ulysses thus, and thus Eumedes' son. What Dolan knows his faithful tongue shall own. Hector, the peers assembling in his tent, a council holds at Elis' monument. No certain guards the nightly watch partake, where ere yon fires ascend the Trojans wake. Anxious for Troy, the guard the natives keep, safe in their cares the auxiliar forces sleep. 
whose wives and infants from the danger afar discharge their souls of half the fears of war. Then sleep those aids among the Trojan train, inquired the chief, or scattered o'er the plain, to whom the spy, their powers they thus disposed, the Haeons, dreadful with their bended bows, the Carians, Cochons, the Pelasgian host, and the Slages encamp along the coast, not distant far lie higher on the land the Lycian, Mycian, and Maeonian band, and Phrygia's horse by Thimbra's ancient wall, the Thracians utmost, and apart from all, these Troy, but lately to her succor won, led on by Rhesus, great Ionius's son. I saw his courses in proud triumph go, swift as the wind and white as winter snow, rich silver plates his shining car enfold, his solid arms refulgent flame with gold. No mortal shoulders suit this glorious load, celestial panoply to grace a god. Let me, unhappy to your flute, be born, or leave me here a captive's fate to mourn in cruel chains till your return reveal the truth or falsehood of the news I tell. To this, Tydides, with a gloomy frown, think not to live, though all the truth be shown. Shall we dismiss thee in some future strife to risk more bravely thy now forfeit life? Or that again our camps thou mayest explore? No. Once a traitor thou betrayest no more. Sternly he spoke, and as the wretch prepared with humble blandishment to stroke his beard, like lightning swift, the wrathful flouchin flew, divides the neck and cuts the nerves in two. One instant snatched his trembling soul to hell. The head, yet speaking, muttered as it fell. The furry helmet from his brow they tear, the wolf's grey hide, the unbended bow and spear. These great Ulysses, lifting to the skies, to favouring powers, dedicates the prize. Great Queen of Arms, receive this hostile spoil, and let the Thracian steeds reward our toil. Thee, first of all the heavenly host, we praise. O oh, speed our labours, and direct our ways. This said, the spoils, with dropping gore defaced, high on a spreading tamarisk he placed. Then, heaped with reeds and gathered boughs the plain, to guide their footsteps to the place again. Through the still night they crossed the devious fields, slippery with blood, o'er arms and heaps of shields, arriving where the Thracian squadrons lay, and eased in sleep the labours of the day, ranged in three lines they view the prostrate band, the horses yoked beside each warrior's stand, their arms in order on the ground reclined, through the brown shade the fulgid weapons shined, amidst lay Rhesus stretched in sleep profound, and the white steeds behind his chariot bound, the welcome sight Ulysses first descries, and points to Diomed the tempting prize. The man, the courses, and the car, behold, described by Dolan with the arms of gold. Now, brave Tydides, now thy courage try, approach the chariot, and the steeds untie, or if thy soul aspire to fiercer deeds, urge thou the slaughter while I seize the steeds. Pallas, this said, her hero's bosom warms, breathed in his heart, and strung his nervous arms. Where e'er he passed, a purple stream pursued his thirsty falchion, fat with hostile blood, bathed all his footsteps, dyed the fields with gore, and a low groan murmured through the shore. So the grim lion from his nightly den, or leaps the fences and invades the pen, on sheep or goats resistless in his way he falls, and foaming rends the guardless prey nor stopped the fury of his vengeful hand, till twelve lay breathless of the Thracian band. Ulysses, following as his partner slew, back by the foot each slaughtered warrior drew, the milky-white courses, studious to convey. Safe to the ships, he wisely cleared the way, lest the fierce steeds, not yet to battle's bread, should start and tremble at the heaps of dead. Now twelve dispatched, the monarch last they found. Tydides' falchion fixed him to the ground, just then a deathful dream Minerva sent, a warlike form appeared before his tent, whose visionary steel his bosom tore, so dreamed the monarch, and awaked no more. Ulysses now the snowy steeds detains, and leads them fastened by the silver reins, these with his bow unbent he lashed along, the scourge forgot on Rhesus' chariot hung, then gave his friend the signal to retire, but him, new dangers, new achievements, fire, doubtful he stood, or with his reeking blade, to send more heroes to the infernal shade, drag off the car where Rhesus' armor lay, or he with manly force and lift away. While unresolved the son of Tydeus stands, Pallas appears, and thus her chief commands. Enough, my son, from further slaughter cease, regard thy safety and depart in peace, Haste to the ships, the gotten spoils enjoy, nor tempt too far the hostile gods of Troy. 
the voice divine confessed, the marshal made, in haste he mounted, and her word obeyed. The coursers fly before Ulysses' bow, swift as the wind, and white as winter snow. Not unobserved they passed, the god of light, had watched his Troy and marked Minerva's flight, saw Tadeus' son with heavenly succor blessed, and vengeful anger filled his sacred breast. Swift to the Trojan camp descends the power, and awakes Hippocoon in the morning hour. On Rhesus' side, accustomed to attend, a faithful kinsman and instructive friend, he rose and saw the field deformed with blood, an empty space where late the courses stood, the yet warm Thracians panting on the coast. For each he wept, but for his Rhesus most. Now, while on Rhesus' name he calls in vain, the gathering tumult spreads o'er all the plain. On heaps the Trojans rush with wild affright, and wondering view the slaughters of the night. Meanwhile the chiefs, arriving at the shade where late the spoils of Hector's spy were laid, Ulysses stopped, to him tied did his boar, the trophy dropping yet with stolen score, then mounts again. Again their nibbler feet the courses ply, and thunder towards the fleet. Old Nestor first perceived the approaching sound. Bespeaking thus the Grecian peers around, Methinks the noise of trampling steeds I hear, Thickening this way and gathering on my ear, Perhaps some horses of the Trojan breed. So may ye gods my pious hopes succeed. The great Tydides and Ulysses bear, Return triumphant with this prize of war, Yet much I fear, ah, may that fear be vain, The chiefs outnumbered by the Trojan train, Perhaps even now pursued they seek the shore, Or... Oh, perhaps those heroes are no more. Scarcely had he spoke, when, lo, the chiefs appear, and spring to earth, the Greeks dismiss their fear. With words of friendship and extended hands, they greet the kings, and Nestor first demands, Say thou, whose praises all our host proclaim, the living glory of the Grecian name, say whence these courses, by what chance bestowed, the spoil of foes or present of a god? Not those fair steeds so radiant and so gay That draw the burning chariot of the day Old as I am to age I scorn to yield And daily mingle in the martial field But sure till now no course has struck my sight like these Conspicuous through the ranks of fight Some god I deem conferred the glorious prize Blessed as ye are and favorites of the skies The care of him who bids the thunder roar And her whose fury bathes the world with gore Father, not so Sage Ithacus rejoined, The gifts of heaven are of a nobler kind. Of Thracian lineage are the steeds ye view, Whose hostile king the brave Tydides slew. Sleeping he died with all his guards around, And twelve beside lay gasping on the ground. These other spoils from conquered Dolan came, A wretch whose swiftness was his only fame. By Hector sent our forces to explore, He now lies headless on the sandy shore. Then o'er the trench the bounding courses flew, the joyful Greeks with loud acclaim pursue, straight to Tydides' high pavilion born, the matchless steeds his ample stalls adorn. The neighing coursers their new fellows greet, and the full racks are heaped with generous wheat. But Dolan's armor to his ships conveyed, high on the painted stern Ulysses laid, a trophy destined to the blue-eyed maid. Now from nocturnal sweat and sanguine stain, they cleanse their bodies in the neighboring main. Then in the polished bath, refreshed from toil, their joints they supper with dissolving oil. In due repast indulge the genial hour, and first to palace the libations pour. They sit rejoicing in her aid divine, and the crowned goblet foams with floods of wine. The end of Book Ten of the Iliad by Homer, as translated by Alexander Pope. And read by